Well, I think every generation um, makes the books that um, contain it, the hopes and dreams it wants to pass on to the next generation. And you can see that going back to the beginning, which um, would be the uh, end of the 17th century, when colonists in New England uh, produced books which were designed to train their children to read the Bible at the youngest possible age, so they would be able to prepare themselves for the afterlife. That was a religious perspective, and that was one of the dominant um, um, concerns of children's books for the next hundred or so years. Of course, not everyone um, shared the, that religious emphasis, and many books began to appear in the colonies in the 18th century, which were, uh, for the most part, imported from England, um, and which focused on the here and now. Um, but um, through the philosophy of um, John um, Locke, who had um, said that it was important to view children as rational beings, not um, children who were born with original sin, which is what the Puritans had said, but um, that these were children who were going to go out into the world if they survived their first years and perhaps have a life different from that which their parents had lived. And so they needed to become literate and they needed to um, have books which were geared to their uh, abilities as, um, as children, books with pictures, books with a little bit of humor, sometimes books that were as much for fun as they were about learning. Um, so th those books um, reflected a very different philosophy of childhood from the ones the Puritans had had. Um, on into the 19th century, um, when America was a new nation, uh, you, uh, by the 1820s, Americans began to feel that they should be producing their own children's books, no longer just importing them from England. And you start to see something like Manifest Destiny expressing itself in nonfiction books, uh, which are all about um, the rest of the world, all the things that a child might want to know who someday would grow up to inherit them. Uh, you know, what is Europe like? What is America like? What is the sun, the moon, and the stars like? There was a man named Peter Parley uh, who wrote something like 200 books on all these different subjects. You wonder how he knew so much, and in fact, I think he made up some of what he said, but he presented it as nonfiction. Um, and then just to add one more uh, layer to this, um, since this is a, you know, a big question, um, after the Civil War, um, there was a big shift because um, up until that time, there was always a moral um, layer to these books. There was, this is what a good child should know, or this is how a good child should behave. And often there'd be a story in which a good child was opposed to, uh, to a naughty child. And it was very clear which was which. After the Civil War, when Americans had um, experienced such horror and had been forced to question everything they knew about morality, um, I think the writers for children felt less sure of themselves, and they became more open to fiction in which um, characters behaved in uh, the more ambiguous ways that we associate with literature as opposed to morality tales. And so you would then begin to find stories, um, the epitome of which might be uh, considered to be um, Tom Sawyer, where you have a, 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 a mischievous child, a, you know, a quote, bad child, who is the hero, because, not because everything he does is what we might approve of, but because everything he does is what we recognize as part of human behavior as it really is. So um, that gives you a flavor for how, from one generation, generation to another, um, the assumptions and the philosophy and the ideas underlying children's books can change and reflect the experiences of the larger culture. I think most illustration um, in children's books was derivative of art styles from England and elsewhere up until the early 20th century. I think that's probably an accurate statement. Um, in the early 19th century and before, it was common for illustrators here literally to copy images that they found in books in England. And because there were no copyright laws in those days, they were free to do so. The term for that was pirating, you know, but it was a kind of wild west in terms of intellectual property and how images moved around. Um, in the 1920s, um, we came to a period um, following World War I, 
And it's interesting how wars are often the points of demarcation for big changes in the children's book world. After World War I, Americans felt that they had um, saved England and France and that it was time for American culture to move on and take its place on the world stage too. Um, and whereas in the past, um, Americans had been importing the English illustrated books by Randolph Caldecott and Kate Greenaway and others, now there was a big push to find um, illustrators here who could do just as well. Um, one of the first picture books that was notable in that regard was um, an alphabet book, The Animal ABC by um, C.B. Falls, who was a Chicago poster designer uh, who happened to meet um, the editor for children's books at Doubleday, and they decided to do a kind of art book together. And there, wasn't, uh, there weren't pictures of children in, in, in that book. They were pictures of animals. But this was a book for children, which said something about the quality of art that children should be exposed to. Um, within a few years, Wanda Gogg, um, a printmaker to begin with, created millions of cats which was also a landmark in the sense that it set a high um, watermark for the quality of graphic design and illustration in a book for young children. Um, I would say that one of the landmarks in the depiction of children came later um, in this, probably the 50s when Marie Sendak emerged on the scene and turned away from the beautiful children that had been characteristic of illustration um, both in England and the U.S., um, images of perfect children. Sendak was much more interested in pictures of um, the kinds of children you'd meet in the street, like himself, short, you know, overweight, um, not particularly handsome, uh, dark-haired, not blonde, not, you know, picture perfect. Um, so certainly one of the landmarks in, in the depiction of, um, of children came then when a new realism informed by, by modern psychology uh, appeared on the scene. And that has cast a long shadow on it to the present, I think, and given um, illustrators license to, to show a range of children. Um, another uh, aspect to this is that up until the 60s, it was very rare to find children of color um, in books for, in the illustrations of books for children. In the 1920s, um, library service to children was a relatively new thing, and the leaders of the um, public library um, movement, um, including Ann Carroll Moore at New York Public Library and, and others, um, set themselves up as the arbiters of children's literature. They were convinced that they knew what was good for children and what wasn't, and they became involved in the in the in the um, and they became involved in making their views known in many different ways, by giving out awards, by publishing lists, by publishing reviews in new major newspapers, and on and on. Um, but at the same time, another group of people came along who also thought they knew what was good for children, and they disagreed with the librarians, and they were the progressive educators, led by Lucy Sprague Mitchell, who was the founder of the Bank Street College of Education, also in New York. And they went head to head and probably on some level had a lot of fun um, arguing with each other over these um, matters. Um, Anne Carol Moore saw books for young children as a, a kind of oasis in life, a chance for children to live outside of the, the daily cares of modern life and to uh, develop and stretch their imaginations. And so she favored once upon a time kinds of stories, which were so well suited to library story hours. Whereas um, Lucy Mitchell um, thought that children were all about learning from their own experience. And even from the age of two and three, they were fascinated by the things of their, in their immediate surroundings and the cities that they were living in, the neighborhoods they were living in, airplanes, trains. She thought there was plenty of magic in that for children. They didn't need to read about castles and kings, which they would probably find confusing anyway. Um, so that was kind of where the battle lines were drawn. And um, Lucy Mitchell, um, was very um, systematic in the way she developed her ideas, first in the form of um, um, a new kind of um, storybook that she wrote herself 
uh, set in the city for the most part and based on various observations that she and her colleagues had made at the Bank Street Nursery School. Um, and then she began to train younger people to write stories in the same vein. And her, her star protege was Margaret Weiss Brown, uh, starting in the mid-1930s. Um, and Brown was instrumental um, because she was a true writer, whereas Lucy Mitchell was more of a theorist. Brown was able to bring poetry to um, the, what Lucy Mitchell called the here and now approach to writing for young children. And in books like Good Night Moon and The Noisy Book and others, uh, to create a new kind of literature for very young children. Um, with time, um, there came to be more acceptance of these books. And as um, more and more Americans sent their children to preschool, um, and or to daycare centers or um, to programs like Head Start, there was a larger and larger demand for books for the very youngest ages of children. And so uh, books that grew out of Margaret Weiss Brown's um, model, the, you know, the sort of the, the, the standard that she set um, began to have a bigger and bigger place in, in the literature for young children. Golden Books um, democratized publishing for young children in America. Um, they were a line of books that sold for a quarter at a time when most picture books sold for two dollars. Most cities and towns had no bookstores and it was relatively hard in America to find books for children if you wanted to buy, buy them and bring them home. But Golden Books um, was unique in selling their books where parents shopped for other things, uh, like five and dime stores and drug stores and um, supermarkets. Um, and so they brought the books to where the people were, and they made them affordable uh, as they had not been before. The way they were able to do that was that um, they were created as a partnership between a big printing company in the Midwest, the Western Printing Company, which had giant presses and which were capable of achieving economies of scale, um, and an upstart New York publisher, Simon & Schuster, um, which had tremendous marketing savvy. They had been the creators of pocket books, paperback books for adults in the 30s, which also sold for a quarter apiece and which made literature, both modern and classic, available to a much, much larger uh, range of, sh of consumers and readers than had been the case in the past. So everything about this uh, was geared toward the notion of uh, making books of, of pretty high quality available to the largest number of people. Um, now, the golden books were illustrated by um, some of the best illustrators of the day. Um, some of them came from Europe because of the war, like Fyodor Rozhenkovsky, who was a Russian emigre, and Tibor Gergely, who was a Hungarian Jew who had to get out of town really quickly and came to New York from, from Budapest. Others were in exile from the Walt Disney Studio. Instead of coming uh, west across the Atlantic, they came east across the United States because they couldn't stand um, the pressures of working for an autocrat, Walt Disney, and they wanted to have their names on their work. Um, and after the war, um, five or six of the best Disney artists came to New York, and one introduced the other to the next to the next uh, to the editors of Golden Books. Um, Gustav Tengren was the first. He was responsible for illustrating The Pokey Little Puppy, among many other books. That was um, always the most popular Golden Book of all. Uh, he, in his former life as a Disney um, artist, had created um, The Seven Dwarfs in Snow White. Uh, there's a kind of kinship between those characters. Um, but he was also capable of doing um, much grander things. Um, his Arabian Nights is really a stunning book. Um, his friends were Alice and Martin Probinson, and they joined the Golden List um, in the late 40s. Um, so did J.P. Miller, who was responsible for the Geppetto character in Pinocchio and many other things in the Disney films, and, and on and on. Uh, Mary Blair was another one. She uh, became well known for, um, later on, for designing the um, World's Fair Pavilion in, in New York. It, it's a small, small world. She had a keen sense of um, design and sort of de decoration. And, um, for many years had been 
Disney's um, con artistic conscience, the, the artist who guided um, the overall design of his films. Um, so, so there was a lot of talent, and um, there was talent on the writing side too. Margaret Weiss Brown became one of their star writers, uh, and there were others. So the librarians did not embrace these books because they thought they were not grandly enough produced. They didn't provide the exquisite aesthetic experience that the librarians hoped that a children's book would give a child. And yet they were very good quality, and American parents accepted them and uh, didn't pay any attention to the reviews that um, the librarians might have um, written about these books. They just went to the uh, supermarket and bought them off the rack for a quarter. There was a real a blind eye turned to the fact that America was a multiracial society. And um, earlier attempts had been made. In, in the post-World War I years, for example, there was a magazine for children called The Brownies Book, and it was created by W.E.B. Du Bois as an extension of the magazine he was publishing for grown-ups at the NAACP called The Crisis. Um, and it was meant to be um, a kind of um, black is beautiful statement that children would receive in the mail once a month with poetry and stories and photography and illustration, um, all intended to create a sense of, of pride in, in the culture and ethnicity of, of being African American. But it didn't um, find a place in the commercial world and went out of business after a couple of years. And again, after World War II, when the American military was integrated for the first time, there was another small um, you know, uh, effort. I mean, it was small in the sense that not too many people uh, bought into it. But uh, one or two editors attempted to publish books of African-American interest for children. Um, and they, too, um, just didn't find a place in, in the commercial world. Southern uh, bookstores would threaten publishers and say that if you do things like this, we won't buy your books, and the publishers caved into that. It was only during the civil rights movement of the 60s that that um, effort um, had enough uh, momentum behind it that it succeeded uh, with books like Ezra Jack Keats's The Snowy Day and, and Stevie by um, John Steptoe both books of the 1960s. Ezra Jack Keats published a picture book in 1962 called The Snowy Day, in which he told a simple story about a little boy in an urban snowstorm who happened to be black. You could see that in the pictures. It's never mentioned in the text itself. Uh, and he won the Caldecott Medal for that book um, the following year in 1963. Um, it was clearly a landmark book because so little had been published for young children with um, children of color um, as the protagonists, or in fact as any sort of character at all, except for the, um, the racial stereotypes which would appear so, every so often in books. Um, and then uh, maybe seven years later, um, Stevie appeared which um, was by John Steptoe. Now, a lot of people thought that Ezra Jack Keats was African-American himself. And as a matter of fact, his real name was Jacob Ezra Katz. He was Jewish and he was not. He was just sympathetic to um, the plight of minorities. And being Jewish, he considered himself a minority too. So there was a point of identification there. During that very charged period of the 1960s, um, Keats um, took some heat for attempting as a white person to make a picture book about African Americans. Um, just as um, William Styron, a few years later, as the author of The Confessions of Nat Turner, was, was criticized in some quarters for um, writing a book in the voice of a former slave, even though he himself was white. You know, was that appropriating another person's culture, or wasn't it? Um, this was an issue that was not settled quickly, and um, Keats, I think, was uh, rather, um, yeah, Keats was, Keats was somewhat bitter about the reaction to what he had done, though he kept going and produced many more books uh, of the same kind for the next probably 30 years. I think it must be true that um, the success of The Snowy Day um, made it more likely that um, a book like Stevie could be published a few years later. Um, Stevie differed from uh, The Snowy Day in a few important respects. One was that it was written in urban street vernacular, 
uh, something that I don't think had ever been done before in a picture book. It was not um, standard English. It was not what librarians and teachers and parents expected to find in a children's book. But it had an authenticity um, that um, gave it special power. And, I, and that, of course, is why um, the publisher, Ursula Nordstrom at Harper, um, wanted it to be published that way. She wanted it to be in the author's own voice. Now, the author, um, John Steptoe, was a teenager when he showed up at Harper's offices with his portfolio. And Ursula Nordstrom, who had prior to that discovered Marie Sendak and published Margaret Weiss Brown and E.B. White and many other greats, uh, was very keen on finding someone from the African-American community who could um, speak to the children of his time. And in, in John Steptoe, she felt that she perhaps had found that person. And so she cultivated his talent and helped him shape a story to suit the, the, the images, the artwork that he had shown her on their first meeting. Um, and so that book grew out of um, intense conversations. And um, as she said, um, her effort to get out of his head onto paper all the things that were there. Um, so it, it was another landmark book and a landmark in this slow awakening of, of American children's literature to the multiracial nature of American society. In 1965, Nancy Larrick, um, who was the president of the International Re Reading Association, uh, published an article in the Saturday Review um, called The All-White World of American Children's Books. And it was a, um, a severe um, criticism of the children's publishing world as a whole, um, pointing out that um, editors up until that time had shirked their responsibility in, um, uh, in, in as much as the books that they published um, gave the impression that America was populated entirely by middle class white people. Um, by the time the article appeared, um, the snowy day had already won the Caldecott Medal, which seems like a surprising uh, chronology because you would have thought um, that that book uh, would have been taken by her as a sign of changing times. But she, she, she really laced into Keats uh, on, on a couple of counts. For one thing, because uh, she, he never specified in the text that Peter was an African-American child, and somehow that was important to her. And then he, she also felt that um, his portrayal of the mother was stereotypical, sort of a mammy kind of character. I think she was a little harsh on Keats, but, um, but she wasn't going to let anybody get away with anything. And her larger point was, of course, correct. Um, some publishers felt that, well, you know, we gave the medal to one book, so we've done that. You know, and, and her real point was that um, tokenism was not the answer and that it was really a systemic um, problem. And um, I think her article did uh, force people to uh, really search their souls and um, think more deeply about um, all the assumptions uh, they had made about their work. In the 50s, uh, the prior decade, um, publishing was very self-satisfied. There was a lot of money around because the baby boom had produced so many new children. School libraries were flourishing. The federal government was handing out tremendous amounts of money for the purchase of science books. Um, and people generally were prosperous. You know, So for all these different reasons, the children's book world was flourishing. And publishers didn't really have to think too much about what they were doing. Um, they thought they were doing things right. You know, so then along came the 60s and showed them that they had still a lot to learn. Psychologists around the turn of the century, Stanley Hall um, in particular, um, studied adolescence as a phase of life um, to an extent that had not been done before. And um, that had ramifications throughout the culture and eventually led um, some writers to, um, to focus on the teen years um, in a serious way. Um, I think there were a few writers of that kind in the 30s and 40s. Some librarians were beginning to pay attention to the specific uh, reading needs of teens. Um, during World War II, there wasn't so much of that, but you had um, an effort to, f to choose books published for adults. 
that would satisfy the needs and yearnings of teenagers during that difficult period in the nation's history. Um, the Catcher in the Rye, which appeared at the beginning of the 50s, though written as a book for adults, became uh, an anthem, in a way, for teenagers and for the writers who followed, who wrote for teenagers, people like Robert Cormier and S.E. Hinton and Judy Bloom. Um, you know, here was a book about um, a teenager who was in real distress, uh, writing in his own voice, and um, with you know compelling um, a compelling feeling of um, honesty about it. Um, he was you know very much the expression of the post-war years when Americans were materially well off, but were just feeling kind of lost and worried about the future. Um, and the, the success of that book um, as, as a bestseller that reached probably hundreds of thousands of people early on um, became a kind of um, starting point for a new genre, what was essentially a new genre in books for, for young people. I think the question of quality in children's books matters a great deal, um, but it's been looked at um, in different ways over time. Um, in the 1920s and 30s, when um, certain powerful librarians ruled the roost and had a great deal to say about what was considered an excellent book and what was considered a bad book for children, the idea was um, that children's books um, had the potential to elevate um, children um, in terms of their appreciation of art and literature and just in culture in general. They were meant to be a kind of up, they were meant to provide an uplifting experience. And the librarians saw it as their duty to put as many of these experiences in the way, in the hands of the child, to, to give them uh, a better experience than they were apt to have if they uh, went to the uh, Saturday movies or bought comic books or any of the other things that the librarians were less approving of in terms of American culture. Um, in more recent times, when li literature has become more marginal to the culture as a whole, I think that the um, emphasis has changed, and librarians and teachers now see that um, books which children enjoy reading, however high or low they may be on the ladder of you know, literary excellence, can be viewed as gateways to literacy. and perhaps to a lifetime of future reading. Um, and so there's less judgment, I think, imposed on children when um, they find books that they really care about. Um, and I think in, in our current circumstances, that's a very sensible approach. Um, I think it's been realized um, in the less, you might say, ideological time that we live in as compared to the 20s and 30s that children read books for all kinds of reasons, some of which have to do with literature and some of which don't. Um, and that um, there's no better way to um, involve the vast majority of children who are not you know, born to read the classics necessarily. Uh, there's no better way to get them started um, than to give them the freedom to enjoy the things that they naturally are drawn toward. Uh, in the hope that some of them, you know, will then move on to other kinds of literature afterwards. Genres have been merging lately, and I think it has to do in part with the fact that um, children are exposed at an earlier and earlier age to an awareness of um, the c culture in general, things that um, in the past the, the adult world had hoped to shelter children from. Um, you know, there's awareness of war and violence and um, drugs and sexuality. All these things have become part of the awareness of, of children at an earlier age. You know, it's said that the average age of Judy Bloom's readers has steadily declined over the last 30 years. Things that would have been titillating to a 13-year-old now maybe get the attention of a 9-year-old because by the time that person is 13, he or she has gotten well beyond that. You know, it's like no, no big deal anymore. Um, so um, that um, has led, I think, to um, the categories beginning to change. Um, young adult fiction and adult fiction are kind of blurring together. And you find more adult writers wanting to write for 
books that are classified as teen books. Um, picture books in some cases have become much more sophisticated graphically than was traditionally the case for picture books and they've begun to merge with the new genre of the graphic novel. Um, so it's to be, I think, expected that um, readers um, from the age of four on into adulthood uh, will be reading more and more books that are as much visual as they are literary in, in, in nature. Um, and also, I guess, um, since the um, time of Margaret Weiss Brown in the 40s and 50s, um, the attention to the needs and interests of the very youngest ages, down you know, to baby level on into um, toddlerhood and preschool, um, have received a lot more attention. Um, so that's another change. Plus, um, the multicultural um, understanding of society I think has finally uh, achieved a kind of critical mass, you know, of um, a, pre a, a presence um, in, in the children's literature at every level. I think people take it for granted now that, that this is how children's books should be, and the, the battle um, has more or less been won. Graphic novels um, e exploded um, four or five years ago. Um, and it seemed that suddenly um, bookstores and libraries felt an urgent need to make a place for them. Um, this against the background of, um, of a real contempt for comic books going back to when comic books were new in the 1930s. Um, a, an attitude that carried over into many parents' homes. You know, children grew up being told not to read the comics, you know, being forced to read them. Uh, sure, the cliche is, you know, under the bed sheets with a flashlight after dark. Um, so there was a long history of um, thinking of the comics as not good for children. And then along comes the graphic novel. Um, and um, I think it's a really fascinating uh, phenomenon. Um, it's, um, it opens um, the possibility of, um, of children who don't see themselves as readers in the, in the traditional sense having a way into books. Um, there's a lot of creativity um, now going into this art form, uh, which um, is a kind of hybrid. Um, uh, it's not picture books because very often they're more sophisticated and yet um, they recognize that um, there's such a thing as visual literacy that can um, thrive and um, contribute to ver verbal literacy. Um, and I mean, to the extent that we live in a, quote, visual era, uh, it would seem to be um, an art form for our time. Um, so I think that there's a lot of creativity and a lot of promise in, in the graphic novel. Um, not too long ago, I met an editor from Bayard, one of the publishers of graphic novels in France, and she said that she prefers to call them comics. So she wants to go back to the sort of fun, you know, the unpretentious old name for these things. Um, I think having established um, the graphic novel as a legitimate art form, uh, it may no longer be necessary to have this sort of, um, you know, serious sounding um, name for, for what's being done. And better, I think she was saying, to remember that, uh, that there's a lot of enjoyment to be had from these books, too. One impact of television on um, books for young children, I think, has been probably to um, limit the attention span that children have for a story, because um, TV has probably created the expectation of things happening rapidly and coming to a conclusion in a fairly you know, short span of time. Um, if you consider Make Way for Ducklings, a book of the early 1940s by Robert McCloskey, the story runs on for 64 pages, and you would never find um, anyone publishing a book that long for children of the picture book age now. Um, so I think one impact of television has been, uh, rightly or wrongly, to um, cause editors to create shorter and shorter texts for younger children. Um, and I think 
you sometimes see the same um, perception about pacing in books for older children. Um, and one of the probably many secrets of the success of the Harry Potter books, I think, is the rapid pacing of the storytelling in those books. Um, I remember, you know, when I read them for the first time, thinking that these were books that um, are made for the television age. If you compare um, J.K. Rowling's writing to, say, Diana Wynne-Jones, um, Diana Wynne-Jones is an English fantasy writer, and her books are all about um, complication and weirdness and sort of reality sort of being stretched like taffy in different directions. Um, uh, you know, you have to be able to concentrate and follow the, um, the crazy logic of her stories. There is a logic there, but you have to put it together in your own head as you go along. Whereas Rowling kind of um, lays out the action for you uh, in a stepwise pattern, which is much easier to follow. And I think maybe that suits a child better who has been grown, who has grown up um, getting their storytelling primarily from television. One example of nonfiction would be the eyewitness books, which appeared probably in the 90s to, to begin with. They were photographically illustrated, um, photo cutouts set against a white background. A very evocative description of them was that they were portable museums. Each book was on a different subject. One might be seashells, another might be arms and armor. Um, it seemed to cover the whole gamut of you know, human knowledge. Um, and um, they're very attractive visually, and each photo on the spread would have a caption, and there might be a more general description of the field of knowledge as a whole to go with the specifics that accompanied each little picture. Um, but there was a, what was missing from those books was, was a narrative thread, something that held it all together. And um, as you know, visually striking as those books were when they were new, when they were novel, um, I began to really miss that um, connecting thread um, after a while. And I have a feeling that um, while people you know, read books for different reasons and in different ways, that, that, that other readers probably would, would have that same longing for the um, the sort of overarching voice behind um, it all, um, tying the information together into something more coherent. Uh, when a children's book is really working, when it's a great book, there's a, there's, a, there's a wholeness to it. There's a feeling that you've entered into a complete world. It may be a world of the author's invention, or it may be um, a kind of framed um, representation of our world you know, a book about this or that um, area of knowledge. Um, but that sense of wholeness is common both to fiction and nonfiction, fantasy and realism. And I think it's one of the greatest things that a, that a book can offer a child who, after all, is relatively new to the world and is confronted with unknowns, uh, questions, you know, mysteries um, every day, things that he or she just can't figure out. Um, the book has the power to say that there are some things in the world that can be understood and that maybe eventually you too will understand them. You know, it's just the most wonderful feeling you can get from a children's book and um, um, it's a shame when that's missing. First of all, I was a, um, a remedial reader when I was in first grade. Um, I had a lot of trouble reading at the beginning. I was in extremely verbal, which seems contradictory, but I, I couldn't figure out <laughs> the, the, the word on paper. Uh, the words in my head made perfect sense to me and I knew what to do with them. Um, when I was in second grade, I had a, a reading teacher who asked me, knowing that I was very verbal, to write a poem for her every week and to be read to her the following week. And I found that I enjoyed doing that and that because I had written the poems myself, I had no trouble reading them. So that was my first um, satisfying experience as a reader. And of course, it also became entwined in my mind with the experience of writing, which was also very enjoyable. Um, once I got started as a reader after that, um, I gravitated toward biography and history. 
Um, and I think as I look back that it's a matter of temperament and some people want stories um, which are true. You know, there's that question, is it true? And I was the kind of child who would always ask that about a, quest about a story, whether in real life or, you know, or on the printed page. Whereas other children seem to ask the question, what if? And they prefer to go off into another version of reality or another uh, reality. And there's no right or wrong about that. It's just the way different people are. So my favorite kind of book has always been nonfiction. And when I um, did my book called um, The Wand and the Word, which is a collection of interviews with writers of fantasy, it was, of course, in itself a nonfiction book. And I felt like a visitor from another planet, uh, the planet of nonfiction. <laughs> uh, as I approached these great people, you know, Madeline Langle, Philip Pullman, Susan Cooper, Lloyd Alexander, and others, uh, trying to understand what it was that they were all about. I have been lucky enough to be a trustee of the Eric Carle Museum from the time it was an idea on an architect's drawing table and to watch the building evolve and then to be part of the running of the museum in the sense that um, I get to advise um, the staff and also to occasionally to curate exhibitions there. Um, it's been very exciting to me um, because um, one of my first adult memories of children's books goes back to when I was in graduate school at the Iowa Writers Workshop, uh, poetry workshop, and I just happened to be in a bookstore in Iowa City and saw a picture book on the um, shelf um, and was drawn to it. Um, it was Snow White, illustrated by Nancy Burkhardt, and had just come out in the mid-70s. And the thought occurred to me at the time uh, why is an art like this um, ever seen in museums? Um, it raised the question of, which I didn't realize was such a pervasive question at the time, why are there pecking orders in the art world? And why is illustration often pegged at the low end? And why, of all illustration, is children's book art uh, at the lowest of the low? Uh, well, what we've seen between then and now, 30 years uh, have passed, is a revaluation of, um, of the art in children's books. Um, in the meantime, it became the field that I wanted to write about. And um, so for me, um, to have started at a time when it was regarded as so marginal, and now to see that it has you know, reached the point where there are now museums devoted to, to showing the art is, is, couldn't be more exciting.